Jesse Chase on with Lisa Blanchard as the host of Airing Addiction. I share often my journey started on this campus. Got sober as a client here, just like you. I really do see phenomenal change. Always hope. I've seen situations that on the surface look impossible become possible. Doing this podcast is to share those recovery stories, be honest about what the challenges are and have some real conversations, but kind of share that out on the, the airwaves. Welcome everybody to Airing Addiction. If you're listening live or listening after this is published, we're just over the halfway point of recovery month. And like we were saying before we hit record here, there still is a lot more recovery events to come. So if you're interested in those, I'm sure we can put some in the show notes. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about some of those today, actually. So uh, really excited about this week's panel. Uh, I know I say that every week, but this is a extra special panel because uh, what we're going to be talking about is not only such a great resource to those of us who work in the field, but also if you're listening and you're in recovery at, at any stage, I can guarantee it's going to be beneficial to you and your recovery program. So without further ado, I'll kick it over to my co-host to introduce our panel. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. Thanks, Jesse. Um, happy Recovery Month. And I I can really think of no better way to celebrate Recovery Month than to have these folks on to really show us how recovery is possible and how it can be shared. Um, so I'm really excited. We're going to be focused today on the importance of peers and recovery support. So we'll talk about recovery coaching. We'll talk about peer recovery support centers and the ways that those with lived experience can really support folks that are working towards or in recovery. And so with us today, um, I'm super happy to uh, to recognize Athena Haddon. I've known Athena for many, many years now. Athena is a woman in long-term recovery. She's currently the executive director of peer services and recovery supports at Spectrum and a women recovery center. Um, and prior to that, she was that one of the very first program directors in the state of the first peer recovery centers um, that Inspectrum ran that program in Worcester. She's got over 30 years of experience, a bachelor's degree. She's got lots of awards. Um, she really is um, a fantastic example of what you can do in recovery and how you can build a life supporting others. Um, and also, we have Billy Parks. He's really um, been fantastic and instrumental in this space. He's the assistant director of recovery and peer support at Advocates. He's worked in the addiction and peer support field for the past 15 years. Um, he is a person who has lived experience with addiction and mental health recovery and uses that experience to expand peer support services throughout Massachusetts while educating on the importance of self-determination and equity in treatment services. And so those were fantastic bios, but really well deserved. You guys have been doing this work for such a long time. So um, Athena, I'll let you start us off. Um, would you want to share just a little bit about your own journey to becoming um, where you are now, all right, supporting individuals from that place of lived experience? Thank you. Thank you, Jesse and Lisa, both for inviting me here today. Um, Oh, yeah, I, you know, the, uh, you know, you read the bio and it's like, you know, the most importantly is I am a person in long term recovery because um, that none of that would be possible. Right. If I wasn't um, you, I, I, none of it would be possible. Trust and believe that. Um, so, um, you know, I, I the, the whole, you know, um, addiction story is not unique. I thought it was unique when I got into recovery, but I, you know, I've been here long enough to know that my story is not unique. You know, I suffered childhood trauma. I, I have uh, addiction that runs in the family. Um, you know, so the, some of the, th some of the things were in place that, you know, made me vulnerable to uh, uh, addiction um, and the disease of addiction. So um, some of those things, uh, I think very early on, my dad was during Vietnam. He, my dad was in the Air Force for 20 years. So part of that story, uh, you know, he was in Vietnam. I remember that being the first televised war, you know, and to, to just as a five-year-old to know your dad is there, you know, and um, 
You know, so I just think about like, I always try to say, when did the trauma start? When did the trauma start? And I go back and some of those are those were my earliest re- recollection, you know, and it just co- seemed to have compounded uh, other, you know, things one after another. Eventually, I found myself really um, by high school, um, really just pretty much experimenting with anything that took me outside of myself. Um, and, and and it just progressed. Um, I found myself really in a, uh, by, uh, by the early nineties, I had now I'm, I'm homeless. I'm hopeless. I, I'm full blown addiction. I have been, had been in and out of the uh, criminal justice system um, many, many times. And um, in 1993, it was like just the end. I was finally, uh, they were just sick of seeing me into in the, in the criminal justice system. I was uh, given an opportunity uh, to go to treatment or do some a significant amount of, of prison time. And at that point in my life, I just felt like I couldn't do it anymore. I was just fe- really, really tired. And I know part of, um, you know, we hear over and over again in recovery, you know, when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I had reached that point and I went into treatment. And, and funny thing is I really half stepped my way into treatment. I didn't jump all in. Part of it was really just, I didn't want to go to jail, but, you know, I look back now and I think about like, and I tell people all the time, like whatever gets you to recovery, no matter how, what it is, what it would just get there, you know? And so, um, and uh, I, you know, I, so I gave this treatment opportunity uh, a chance because I didn't want to go to prison. And so really I took a lot of shortcuts. I, I look back now, I really just, you know, the only person I was really harming taking shortcuts was myself. You know, I didn't realize it, but I came in, I came in, that was my lifestyle when I got here. I was accustomed to taking shortcuts, you know? So when I got into recovery, there was a lot of behaviors that I had to work on after I learned how to just not use a day at a time, you know? So that's one thing about recovery. Like when I entered recovery, nobody said, you know, um, you gotta be, you know, you gotta be all in, you know, I came and I was able to work on all my behaviors as I was in recovery and, and, you know, nobody kicked me out cause I was still behaving badly my first early recovery years, you know? So I, I, I chose a 12 step pa- uh, pathway. Um, and I, you know, I went regularly, daily, probably for close to 15 years. And I practiced, uh, really, uh, uh, I was really all in to 12 step, you know, I was doing it the way it was laid out. I was really all in, um, in 2008, I was hired as program director, um, with at spectrum to the open up the first peer recovery center that, uh, Lisa mentioned. Um, and, Part of that was, you know, we started talking about the silos that recovery people in recovery were in and which I didn't really think that was an issue prior to working at the peer recovery center. I'm like, okay, I'm in my 12 step a over here and they're in their 12 step a over there. And they're on their medicated assisted recovery over there. We're all in our own places. I don't see the problem. But when I got into uh, working in peer to peer uh, in the peer recovery centers, and we started talking about language like building recovery capital and things like that and the importance of that. You know, I know I learned that how much stronger we could be because, you know, everybody's got the same goal. We want to get everybody. We want to get people well. Right. And so uh, we want to get people into recovery. And so if we could all come together and support people in recovery, regardless of pathways. So I started to just open my mind a little more and be more open to more pathways and working together with other pathways and, 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 and really just understanding more pathways. Cause I was, I felt like I was pretty closed minded up until that point about uh, multiple pathways. And so one of the things that I'm really, really grateful about is the peer recovery center has really taught me so much more about peer support and how much stronger we can be. You know, the peer recovery centers, I'm proud to say that today, we initially, that in 2008, when we opened those first five, uh, you know, people were unsure what they were. Uh, They didn't want us uh, opening in certain parts of the neighborhoods and things like that. And we really have become a great assets to community. I often say the peer recovery centers are as valuable to communities as senior centers or youth centers, and they really are. They are peer-led uh, spaces that provide individuals and families 
uh, with uh, the opportunity to give and receive support uh, in their own community environment. Um, their warm, welcoming spaces grounded in the multiple pathways of recovery. They give a sense of hope and belonging. Um, you know, addiction, they say the opposite of addiction is connection. And, you know, that's what happens at the recovery centers. I, I love it. You know, every day, I'm partial to everyday miracles because that's the center that I opened in 2008. And, um, and, you know, it, 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 Spectrum was just awesome over at that program. You know, the program is peer led. Spectrum is a treatment based uh, program historically. Right. And so to have now this peer, uh, driven um, program that it was hosted by Spectrum. It was a learning experience for all of us at that time. I, I'm sure Lisa can remember that. You know, we had to actually, the agency as well, but Spectrum jumped really, they jumped all in and they were open to understanding the peer, the peer model that they were there to support it, not guide it or drive it. You know, the members were to do that. And so it's really fun now. Sometimes when I go to Lisa or, you know, in the agency and I'll come with a, an issue that I'm having at one of the peer recovery centers. Now the agency is all like, well, what do the members think? And that's just a great thing to say that the, the spectrum really gets this model. And it's been really a joy um, to work. And so when I came back um, a year and a half ago, a year and some months ago, um, as executive director, it's really been my passion, uh, peer recovery. I just love the work. I love working with other people. I love talking to the people that are really um, just getting into recovery and offering the hope that recovery is possible. It's um, So I'm just thrilled to be back at Spectrum and working in this role. Well, I can say we are thrilled to have you back um, for sure. I think that's a great segue because there are some connections with Billy and Everyday Miracles, but I'd love, yeah. um, Billy, for you to share as much of kind of your journey into becoming a recovery coach and doing peer support um, as you'd like to share. And then we can have just great conversation. Thank you, Lisa and Jesse, for the opportunity. Well, you know, it starts back. Um, I'm, I'm a, I live in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Um, I come from a good neighborhood with good people, but with challenging circumstances. And through the lens that I, you know, seen as, as a, a young adult uh, or a child or teenager, um, incarceration, um, incarceration, I'm a, I'm a, say, a victim of the, the crack epidemic. Um, close family members and friends were caught up in that crack epidemic in the 80s. You know, I remember when we were hanging out in the parks and playing touch football and and then, you know, they were a little older than me and, you know, my close cousins and their friends were disappearing. They weren't doing those things no more. And that was when crack was coming in. Um, other family members doing that. And so growing up, I, you know, I'm an avid reader. Um, I like knowledge of any sorts, um, and I like to understand and 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 think about things. A critical thinker, and I was always trying to not become a product of my environment. That was my goal. I was, you know, steadfast on that. I don't want to be a drug user. I don't want to sell drugs. I don't want to be stuck in this environment. And, you know, as an adult, early on, I had a child, and and. You know, I lived in a heroin infested neighborhood and 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 somehow, some way, curiosity, you know, trying something, thinking that it would be different for you. And, you know, and, and that led to a serious um, heroin addiction. And I remember going in and out of treatment, uh, Spectrum in particular, you know, over 50 times, you know, in and out. And at home and in my community and my family, you know, I seen this stigma towards me doing that. It was like, what is he doing? We don't do that, you know? And mind you, everyone I know, their detox was conquered prison. What's the house of correction, you know? Um, and now, fast forward now, it's federal prison. So, um, but I kept pushing through because I, I knew 
who I was. I just didn't know how to stop and I didn't know how to get out of the situation I had. And, you know, I kept pushing through and, you know, finally, you know, 50 plus times I found myself in a situation and I went to detox and eventually went to spectrum um, TSS and, you know, and, and along that journey, for me, I heard some gentlemen that came to the old RP in Spectrum residential program. It was a therapeutic community. You know, I, I was up there three times and these gentlemen came out of Framingham to speak and they were talking about their substance use and and it was similar to mine. And more importantly, they looked like me. And I had never really heard that before. You know, I don't I don't live in urban centers with Roxbury or, you know, Baltimore, you know, a family in both places, but I lived in Fitchburg, North Central Mass, you know, and there were people of color there, but, you know, um, we didn't have the resources as such and the knowledge. And um, they looked like me and they told their story and, and I kept that. And once I finished that TSS, um, I went on to a halfway house in Worcester and, um, I completed that program and then went on to a sober living environment and 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 did that for a few years and 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 somehow a friend of mine who was uh, actually you know a roommate living in that sober house he was a member of Peer, uh, Everyday Miracle Center and um uh, you know I was looking for some work and and he said you know you need to meet Athena and come down you know and I did that I met her I you know I came down I applied and um you know, that was in 2009, September, I started there. And um, I think that was when they were just about forming a community. I could see a community starting. And then a little while later, we moved across the street to Pleasant Street. And um, and that's when things really kicked off. But, um, you know, recovery for me has been a long journey because it's been lonely. Um, again, I come from an environment where that's not the norm where people go out and ask help, seek assistance, their, you know, therapy and counseling. And, you know, um, I have family members who been using since the eighties and still using today. Um, and so I had, a, I had a, a different challenge for me was just trying to do what was right for me. And, you know, I successfully did that in certain ways. And once I got to the recovery center, um, things opened up for me, it, you know, I started seeing um, people who look like me. Um, I started seeing people who were coming from different circumstances that, that were similar to mine, you know, who didn't look like me. Uh, so, you know, I, I didn't have to relate everything to me. Um, and, and I started just thinking about ways and, 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 you know, different opportunities to just, you know, get outside of my comfort zone and get involved, you know, because I'm more reserved and, and, and more laid back. And I found that at Everyday Miracles and um, it was a great opportunity. Um, and I think in 2012, it was, I uh, went to the first Recovery Coach Academy training and those five days changed my life. Um, I would go home after each day and I was interested in what the next day was going to bring. And it changed my life and how to look at recovery because um, I finally found something that said, hey, you know, you are the expert in your own experience. And what would you like to do? And, and that was something I fought against going through, you know, 12 step and stuff like that. I did those things for the first six years of my recovery. But, you know, I had trouble, um, you know, I'm a person with social anxieties. Um, and, you know, if, if my sponsor is telling me to do 90 and 90, they're not considering the whole me, you know? And I get to meetings, I pull up and, you know, I get an hour getting dressed, get to the meeting, pull up, see the parking lot full, drive through and go home, you know? No one would talk to me about that. So I had to do things a different way in my way. So when I got into the peer support world and, and started seeing, you know, the difference between following your own path and a path that someone else blazed, um, it really worked for me. And today I'm a certified recovery coach and a certified peer specialist. Uh, I'm a person with lived experience in both. And, you know, it's been a 
a great, beautiful journey, and it continues with with many, many chapters to come. Um, you know, and I look forward to um, what's next. So, thank you, Billy. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm just always taking it back anytime we we hit record on one of these the the similarities that we all share. You know, Dean, I heard you say that the opposite of addiction is connection, right? And you know, when we met at the Peer Recovery Center out in Marlboro, and we were talking about that. The whole theme was connection. The whole day was connection, right? And then, Billy, this is my first time getting to hear your story, and and I can relate a lot to it. And I I can relate. You know, I too, being someone in long term recovery, spent many months at that old White House on the hill, the RP, and and credit that really with the foundation of my recovery and why I sit here today. And I remember while we were in RP. Every Friday night, they would they would take a few of us and shuttle us over to the peer recovery center connection, the recovery connection in Marlboro, and and just being there and and you know Billy, I heard you say that you know it's it's an inviting environment. You know, uh, you, you didn't say these words, but in my mind's eye, I was thinking, "Come as you are," right? You talked about getting out of your comfort zone. That was way out of my comfort. I mean, the whole recovery thing in general early on was way out of my recovery zone. And then you want me to go to some place where I'm just there. And then what, what do we do? What do we talk about? And it it quickly turned to one of the highlights of the week for me to go there and, and see the people there and, and see what was going on. So uh, to either one of you, um, I'd love to hear, you know, if, if somebody doesn't have that experience yet going to a peer recovery center, um, you know, what would you say that they're they're going to experience what would you say that they can expect to see at a peer recovery center kind of just walk through the new person that's that's not yet familiar with one of our or one of any peer recovery centers um i'll take that question um yeah the the peer recovery centers well you know we one of the biggest things and we really want to emphasize is that they're they are warm and well welcoming they're not it's not a clinical it's not like sitting in the waiting room while the next person sees you or any of that you walk in and you feel like you can just walk into anything that's happening in the recovery center without waiting without making an appointment then there's things going on all the time so we hope that when you walk in that the first thing that you're asked is how welcome and how can we help you in your recovery today? And we hope and that's what we're seeing. Uh, that's kind of the theme at most of the recovery centers. Um, but we do, th there's just so many um, uh, things that happen within the day. And those things are driven by uh, the members. So the members, once they come in, it, I, what, this is what I see at the recovery centers. And I feel like I have a front row to it and I just love to see it. People come in and they're very sometimes have the social anxiety, have sometimes don't know their, where their place is or how to get involved. And Billy, I think, can remember this. And one thing I remember mostly about working with Billy, Billy would see those people that were often not right away engaging and he would go and like spend time with them to get them in. and i remember that specifically about billy having a real gift to see those people because sometimes we see the people that are taking the lead roles right but billy was really good at seeing those people that couldn't find their way there yet you know and, and helping them along the way so we see people come in and we with that peer-to-peer -peer support just like that we try to meet people exactly where they are and there's so many opportunities so what's nice is we see people come in sometimes broken sometimes unsure of where they fit in or if this is even for them and then we see them like really start to dive in. And next thing you know, they're taking leadership roles. And when I come in and I see like within two or three months, I'll see somebody come in really so early in recovery and coming in and now like wearing their volunteer badge proudly and like walking around with the billboard and, and like really uh, getting the day to day activities going. And they're taking these leadership roles. They're running the groups. They're cheering the community meetings. And it's just such, and then we're sending people to recovery coaches. And like Billy said, 
that changed my my life as well. Recovery coaching, it put language to a lot of things that I was feeling anyways. I remember actually like very early on in my recovery uh, in 12 step, I said to uh, uh, my sponsor at the time, I said, how long do I have to call myself an addict? And she said to me, and, and this is nothing against any 12 step it's, or, or anything else. This is just the way things are done. And I knew this. She said, I was five years in recovery. And she said to me, I said, how long do I have to call myself an addict? Because I don't know, like, I'm not doing the things that an addict does. Like, I'm not lying, stealing, she, those kind of behaviors. And she said to me at that time, your disease is on you. And she suggested that I go to a meeting and share about that which I did. I did. It was the suggestion. And I did. I followed the suggestion. Many years later, like after going to recovery coach and reflecting back on some of those early times that I had these thoughts, it was not my disease. It was my dis-ease with wearing a label that didn't fit anymore, you know? So I, you know, I, 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 that addict in, 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 in the recovery coach Academy, we learn about the labels and how, you know, how they continue to like, you know, we had do this exercise where we say, what do you think about when you see the word, when you hear the word addict? And it's all these derogatory words of like, you know, thief, liar, cheater, disease, you know, all these things. And if I'm using that word to put on myself, you know, I understand why I had to do that early on, because there was a level of denial that I had, you know, I understood that. But once I started to change my life, that for me, and this is just for me, that didn't feel well anymore. But so the I, I'm kind of getting off the subject, which I sometimes do. I belong to the on and on club. And uh, but I, I there was just there's so much. And I can't say one center offers the, the centers offer. They, they support the, the needs of that community and no two communities look alike. So, um, you know, th there's just so much to do. I suggest people go on uh, the Bureau of, of the Bureau of Substance Abuse website and look up the peer recovery centers to find there's 40 now. And that's another thing I want to just stress. This is a state in Massachusetts, the small state of Massachusetts. We have now 40 funded peer recovery centers. And I remember in the earlier days, we we're like, we're not stop until we have one in every single community. And, and we know their value now. You know, we've been in this, we've been doing them for 15 or 18 years, 2008. What's the math on that? Is that 18 years now? 15? What is that? I don't know. But we've been, uh, yeah, 15, yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's so we, it's just great. So that's it. One of the things that strikes me as he, listening to you both talk, right, and, and you know, I similarly much respect to the 12-step community, right, I, my full disclosure, right, Jesse has lived experience, I don't, I'm a clinician, I learn every single day from you, Athena, from the peer recovery support centers, from recovery coaches, from those with lived experience, this is really a movement, right, this is like a change, so some of the roots of it have been around for a long time, right, like sponsorship, supporting others, that theme of connection has been around for a long time. But I really appreciated, Billy, when you were talking about your experience um, and how what you do now is different and how the recovery centers were different, right? The difference between following your own path or following a path that somebody else has laid out for you that worked for them. Um, and it's really the way I've kind of been just kind of really trying to you know, engage with the recovery community, work alongside the recovery community. You know, it's really been a fantastic evolution of, you know, really embracing multiple pathways like you talked about, Athena, um, you know, doing things a little differently, you know, having peer recovery support centers, having recovery coach roles, instead of doing this for free in your own time, just as part of your value system, this actually can be what you do as a mission-driven career um, and help uh, you know, thousands, millions of people in ways that I can't, right? Like I can't help from a place of lived experience. I can do some clinical work. I can do some trauma support. I can help with your anxiety, right? Like I can do those things, but I, I, can't, I can't help from that place of lived experience. And um, I still think there's room to go, you know, in this movement. I think the, the, the rest of the addiction treatment and recovery space needs to fully buy in um, as much as as you all have into the value of peer support. Can you 
Um, can either of you share just a little bit about your perspective of how you see that peer support as different than treatment? Like, what does it offer that has nothing to do with, you know, that office that you're talking about, Athena? Like, how do how how is how is peer support different? Well, I I'll answer that. I could say, well, historically, you know, many of us have been, you know, um, labeled as clients or consumers. And, and when you think of the term consumer, you know, you can think of something that's just consuming or eating everything that's given to them without a choice, you know, largemouth bass, you know, you could fish and catch those with, you know, pretty much anything, you know, um, or considered our diagnosis, um, you know, we're represented as sick, broken, you know, different, different things, um, and just commonly approached for an assessment. An evaluation. Uh, recovery coaching is different when when you're approaching somebody and, and you're saying, "What would you like to do?" And before that, let me back up. When I'm approaching somebody, you know, I did a lot of recovery coaching um, in the Metro West hospitals, um, the three different hospitals in the Metro West. And first of all, I'm walking into their room and I'm asking, "Can I sit down?" I'm not standing over them with a clipboard or anything like that. Can I sit down? And then, you know, I explain why I'm there. And then what would you like me to know about you? You know, and then we get into the recovery aspects and what would you like to do? And, you know, once the person identifies a goal, you know, we support them in examining the realities of reaching that goal for, for, for first thing, and then exploring and reviewing the options that are out there, you know, different resources. And then we continue to support them as they move from preparation to action. And that's simply a recovery wellness plan that a recovery coach uses. Um, it's a whole different approach from any other type of uh, self-help or, you know, because, again, you're coming off of historically a method that been used by many others. But this is like you're not an expert. You are the expert, you know, you're not amongst many experts. You are the expert in your own life and your own experience. And sometimes um, people will look up at that and they don't know what to do because they never heard that, you know, and I think that's very important. And I want to just jump back to the previous question. When you walk into, say, for instance, Everyday Miracles, by design, there's not, you know, staff don't wear suits and ties. And, you know, when you walk in, you can't pick out staff if it's your first time. And that's by design, because if you walked in and staff are in suits and ties, oh, that's staff, and you walk for them for some information and a resource, you walk past all the experts. You know, so you're greeted at the front desk by a volunteer. And then they're going to show you around and, and, and then others will say, hey, and introduce you. So that's the process. Um, I hope that answered your question. That was great, Billy. And and that's just such a revolutionary uh, model, right? Where I remember when I did my Recovery Coach Academy at summer school in Worcester. And I remember just reflect, you know, it was as you were saying it, actually. Um, I, I remember reflecting and, and some of the people that I met with. That, that was years ago and I still keep in contact with um, and, and just reflecting on how much help that we were doing across the state. And now to hear that there's, you know, 40 peer recovery centers. I mean, that's just like mind blowing and, you know, how different it is. You know, both of you have touched on the, the differences than in a traditional program and, uh, you know, for for my own experience, yeah, coming, for, you know, living in that traditional therapeutic community and then getting sent to the peer recovery, my my head was spinning the first couple of times. Like, wait, what? This isn't what we do at the other place that I sleep at. This is way different. And and I guess the benefit to, you know, all pathways is that the the person Right. Not the consumer, the client, but the person, the the expert on their recovery gets to choose what works for them. And what a beautiful choice it is to to walk into the peer recovery center and, you know, maybe be dealing with some mental health. Right. Billy, you mentioned, you know, social anxiety. Yeah, that's pretty common. I, I qualify for that. Um, you know, so maybe 
being referred to a mental health professional for therapy, but also talking to somebody who also has social anxiety and how they cope with it in the day to day, right? Breathing exercises or going for a walk or meditation or on and on and on. So um, I think it's just, it's, it's great the work that we get to, to do um, as an agency and in all the different arms and, and all the different other agencies that are out there. Uh, I guess my question is, what do we foresee the recovery peer support? Uh, what's next, right? What What's the next big thing that we're working toward or, or goal as a movement? Because I agree with Lisa that this is a movement. So what's next for our movement? Well, for one of the things, um, you know, I... <laughs> When I was in recovery, I didn't know there were so many things that I should be involved in. Uh, like when I was before I got into peer recovery support, I mean, like when I got here, I learned there was agencies like more Massachusetts Organization for Addiction Recovery um, that were really fighting battles from people like me way before I got here. You know, they, they were instrumental in the funding of the peer recovery centers and getting that off the ground. Um, and so, you know, part of the movement is like joining, like, you know, being part of advocacy efforts uh, that are affecting people like us. There is many things that are going on um, uh, uh, that we should know about. And so the recovery centers like start to educate folks about that. Like there's some bills that could really impact uh, people in recovery that are being pushed through. And, you know, this isn't always just like political. This is really about things that can impact insurance and impact, impact us, uh, you know, with like Section 35s and with uh, 51As, uh, you know, people that are doing really well in recovery um, are automatically filed a 51A when they give women, not people, women, when they give birth, there's an automatic filing of a 51A initiating the DCF, DCF to be involved, even when people are doing really well in their recovery. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of things that are going on. So the movement really is about change, you know, it's, and it's about making, uh, you know, getting things, uh, Billy talked about it, uh, the, um, the equity and the equality. I just learned yesterday, I was on a call with the Bureau and we learned that the, you know, black community has an increase of 42% in increase in overdoses, um, over the last year, you know, and it's it, it, so, you know, these are the things that people when we talk about a movement, there's so many places to get involved to help, you know, when I got into recovery, I was like, I, you know, I thought, hey, I'm in recovery, I've arrived, this is all I need to do. But as now the movement is evolving, and we're pulling, you know, we're getting all these um, pathways to talk and communicate cr across, you know, pathways, we're really learning how strong we are together and how we can come together um, with that. And I, Billy can ch chime in on this as well. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great um, component of it. I, I guess once you become comfortable in, in, in yourself and your process, then, you know, advocacy is the next step. You know, fortunately for me, I work uh, for an agency um, and we have a peer team that consists of 40 peer uh, support uh, workers. And, you know, the majority of them are peer specialists, you know, identifying with mental health, lived experience and working with people around that. And, you know, we have about 10 recovery coaches and growing. Um, but one component of, of what we do um, we're all human rights officers for our agency in, in different group living environments and programs we have. And, you know, I'm currently the human rights officer for all of our outpatient clinics. And when you think about that from a perspective, you know, peer support, you know, recovery coaches, peer specialists being change agents, you know, and when you're supporting people, um, it, it's also social justice. And so just yesterday, you know, I was sitting down with uh, somebody uh, from BSAS, you know, and, and I knocked on the door and I asked, you know, can I have a moment of your time, you know, and we set up a Zoom call and, you know, and I brought the ideas of, you know, BIPOC recovery coaching, 
BIPOC needs, supervisors, you know, understanding the needs of uh, individuals, BIPOC um, communities, um, what we need when we come into the workforce and coming, you know, we work in, coming to this workforce, a lot of us don't have the corporate world experience, you know, and the lens that the corporate world is looking at us through, you know, and that, and that can generate to, to all different people in the peer support world. So, you know, I, those are things I'm doing. Um, I'm knocking on doors and I'm, I'm asking questions. Um, anytime I see anything that's related to BIPOC funding, you know, who are the stakeholders, who's involved, what's going on? Because one of the things I, I have to deal with is when I go home, I still have family members and friends who are still walking the streets doing the same thing, mental health, substance use issues, and, and not knowing that there is a way out. Because one of the problems with intergenerational trauma of the descendants of slaves is the trust issues. That transfers generation after generation after generation. So, you know, if I go and sit down and sit across from a, a counselor or a clinician, you know, sometimes I'm transferring the idea that you look like my oppressor, you know, and I have to work on that. And you may not understand that. So that's why I'm not showing up. I'm missing appointments or, you know, I'm not really getting involved when outreach is it's trying to get me involved. So these are the things that, you know, I've been trying to speak up on and recovery coaching as a whole. Another component I was talking about is just the professionalism of it, you know, getting people in, they're, they're starting these new jobs. Sometimes it's their first job in a while. Um, they worked in a factory. They never worked in, you know, the, putting out emails and responding in certain ways. So like, let's support them. Let's not, you know, support them in failing. Let's support them in being successful. And, you know, as Athena said, you know, at some point, you know, I was thinking, oh, my recovery is just for me and, and it, this is what I do. But like, I got comfortable and, and I started, um, you know, with the help of my team, you know, because they do a lot of advocacy, a lot of state house stuff. And, you know, and, and they allow me to do things that, that are close to my heart. So um, that's very important. How can the treatment systems help you all better in this, right? We've got peer recovery support centers and you get and you get to do what you want there. But, you know, we also need, I, I hear you really clearly because I think it's a real challenge, right? We, when Athena talks about the overdose rates in the BIPOC community, those folks aren't coming to our program. It doesn't matter how open our admissions are. It doesn't matter if we have walk-in. It doesn't matter if we do everything that we think is reducing barriers, if we're still not serving everybody that needs our support. And the trust issue is huge there. How can, how do you think that peers could support that? Like connection to care, connection to life-saving medication, connection to treatment, um, and to recovery. Um, you know, how how can we make room for you, right, in, in our treatment programs? Well, the simplest way, but still complex, is the state and other agencies need to put their money where their mouth is and put people like myself and others on the ground in communities, walking into barbershops, hair salons, faith-based environment, mosques, all different things, restaurants, culturally where we eat and where we gather and talk about, hey, we do recover. We do ask for help. I understand that we don't trust the system. You know, the system has been against us for so long, but we do recover. Another example is um, agencies have to realize that when you're counseling on any level, mental health or addiction, you're using the uh, DSM-5, which is the one used right now, right? So the American Psychiatric Association or something, two years ago, they just came out and said they were complicit in racism against people of color. Mm -hmm. And in that book that people are being diagnosed with, there's still nothing about intergenerational trauma of descendants of slaves. So we have to move from different corners and different ways to really talk about the truth. If you don't see me as a person and understand me, how can you help me and support me and treat me? Those are such fantastic points. And I think one of the ways that we can do that is to put people with lived experience and in the BIPOC community in, in positions of power to actually be part, sitting at the table making those decisions. 
right? Like we need to change that dynamic um, of it, you know, being a very, um, you know, white male focused system and the addiction treatment system still is that, right? It's still very much that. And in, in, until we change that dynamic, I think it's going to be harder. But I also completely agree on the funding, right? We need to, it can't just be, we pay for it, but we pay for it, like, but, but this much. And so you're spending this much time to get paid for this much work, right? Like it needs to be funded at the same levels as clinical support. I believe really strongly that the, um, the lived experience is just as valuable as a clinical degree. Right. And, I, you know, I was very happy to see in this most recent funding that we were, they were able, the state did fund um, Torchlight Recovery Center, which is out of the Nation of Islam. So it was really nice to see that the Bureau is actually to, under, you know, they're hearing some of our, our pleas to, like, get the money in, in the BIPOC communities. And so that was really um, it's, it's and they've been really uh, working closely with BSAS on exactly what Billy was talking about. Awesome. So, anything that we didn't talk about that you'd want folks to know about the value of you know peer support and recovery coaching, like maybe a, a brief description of what's the difference between you know this comes up when when people ask me all the time between a case manager or a recovery support navigator, which is essentially an addiction case manager and a recovery coach, right? What What's the difference there? Does anybody want to describe that for me? From my understanding, um, I also worked at um, Shirley Minimum and the Recovery uh, Correctional Recovery Academy uh, for Spectrum. Yeah. Um, and we had uh, recovery support navigators there. They are uh, often engaged in uh, some clinical assessments. Um, you know, they were supporting people around Medicaid to support recovery programs and stuff like that. But there was a component, I believe, where they had to do a clinical assessment. Case management would be similar. Um, peer support is, is strictly, you know, at advocates, we don't wear badges out in the community when we're supporting somebody. We don't sit, I mean, we're meeting with them. We don't sit behind a desk, we sit with them. Uh, it's, it's so many particulars, um, you know, and one thing I'd like to, before I forget, is that we have a program, it's called The Living Room. Um, it's at 284 Union Ave in Framingham. It's a emergency room alternative uh, for people in crisis, um, any emotional crisis, distress, um, it's open 24 hours, the phone lines are on 24 hours, it's peer run. There's no clinicians, there's no clinical work in there. It's all peer specialists, recovery coaches working in there. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. And and how that works is again by you know um being able to stay in your role and fidelity to your role. Um, because as soon as we start um, you know, giving people urines or medication or you know, holding their money or different things, you know, um, the fidelity of role is lost, you know. Um, so I think that's the biggest difference between case management and, and the recovery support navigator is they are more attached to the clinical side of things. And that's okay. Clinical is a component that works for a lot of people, including myself. Recovery coaching and peer support, peer recovery centers are just an added resource. And I know Michael Arillo, I think, is one that said this to me. He's the director now at Everyday Miracles. When I, you know, when I was asking, tell me about recovery coaching from your perspective, what's the difference? People ask me all the time about case management. I think pretty much the description he gave me is that case managers, RSNs, all of those roles are there to do things for you, right? And a recovery coach is there to do things alongside you. Um, and that, I think, helped my perspective, right? So that it's really like very you know self-directed and you're just there to offer support and guidance from that place of lived experience. Um, do with and not, do with and and not for. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love that's that. That's a great quote. And something as we're kind of winding down here, something that we always love to ask our guests and I personally am invested in um resources. So you know for somebody that's 
uh, you know, looking for a recovery coach or somebody that is a recovery coach and looking for a resource, uh, could be a book, could be a podcast, could be something that you find valuable to your own recovery journey. Um, do either one of you have any resources that you'd like to share? Well, sure. The, you know, of course, the recovery centers, and you can, they can get the list at BSAS, but I just wanted to just shout out Spectrum's uh, four and soon to be five, which would be Everyday Miracles in Worcester, um, New Beginnings in Lawrence, the Recovery Exchange in Lynn, the Recovery Connection in Marlboro, and will soon be opening in Southbridge. Um, so that's exciting. So the re, the re, and then one thing about the recovery center is they are they house resources. They really do. They house resources in those communities. So I would suggest anybody to just even just to call. They'll have, they'll know where the local twelve step meetings are. They'll know where the faith based groups are. They will know where the IOPs are. They will know all the resources. And those recovery centers are really the hub of recovery in all their own communities. So um, I would suggest anyone anyone start there. I would like to add again uh, the living room at 284 Union Avenue, Framingham. Um, it's an emergency room alternative, crisis alternative uh, for anyone going through emotional distress from anything. Um, it's peer run. Also um, at Advocates, we have uh, Mass Health Billing for Recovery Coach. Um, the program's called Holding Out Hope. Um, you could just reach me just to keep it simple uh, Billy Parks at 508 907 8394. And again, recovery support centers are everywhere. They're right in your backyard. Um, please step into those. Um, you know, as soon as you enter, you'll feel a part of something. Um, advocates is actually family continuity is merging with advocates, and they have no one walks alone recovery center in Whitingsville. So we'll be uh, having that a part of our um, resources as well. So. That's right. I forgot about that. And Noah and EDM do a lot of collaborations together. That's great. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. That's awesome. So I just have to say in the past, I don't know, two year, two and a half years, I don't even know, James, how long I've been doing this podcast, but it's been a while. I started during COVID. So I think maybe three years. I'm not really sure. Somewhere around there now. Um, and it is probably the most recovery coach peer support thing I've ever heard that Billy you're the first person who was like just call me directly right like if you yeah. need something here's my phone number just call me and I love that so much <laughs> that's yeah, it that's you know cool. and we we hope people call but they don't call that and some you know I, I remember when I was going to 12 step and the meeting list would go around and you, know, you put your number on it sometimes people would say I don't want everybody guys said nobody calls <laughs> like I don't know I put my meeting <laughs> you want them to call. I love getting that call at midnight to say, you know, somebody call me instead of go get high, you know. You know, part of recovery is giving back. So that's we wait, we wait for opportunities to give back. Mm -hmm. But I just say one thing just to add to this real quick. The part of the peer support um, relationship is it's mutual. You know, we have a mutual lived experience and different things, but it's also reciprocal. Um letting the person know that you're supporting that they can teach you things too you know it's just, it's, it's not a, a a relationship where i have power over them you know with mutual and another thing is it's important that i talk to the recovery coaches i supervise is make sure the person takes responsibility for their success and not giving it to you because it's really their self-determination and willingness that, that made this possible. We're just there along for the ride. I just wanted to add that. It's a great I point. That. I honestly right. can't think of some better way to kind of wrap up this podcast. Any last thoughts, Jesse? Yeah, I have a ton, but we've we've already gone over. You guys are great. Thank you so much, Billy and Athena. For... I just want to add that this, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Jesse. Go ahead. Add that the statewide celebration is Tuesday, the 26th in Boston at uh, Faneuil Hall. And that's a statewide celebration for Recovery Month. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I did look up some events from more that have like a million things going on this month. So uh, we'll make sure that those are in the show notes for this episode. So thank you both very much for sharing your time and your knowledge and resources with us today. Uh, 
thank you everyone for listening. And if you'd like to hear more of us, hit like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we will be back next week with another episode for Recovery Month. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Everybody, really appreciate you. Thanks, Billy. Nice seeing you.